These lectures are part of the Great Courses series. They are produced by the Teaching Company. These lectures are titled Roots of Human Behavior. The lecturer is Dr. Barbara J. King. Dr. King is a biological anthropologist who has taught at the College of William and Mary since 1988. Professor King received her BA in anthropology from Douglas College and earned her MA and PhD from the University of Oklahoma. She is currently conducting research on gorillas at the Smithsonian's National Zoological Park in Washington, D.C., and has studied ape and monkey behavior in Gabon, Kenya, and the Language Research Center at Georgia State University. Currently a university professor for teaching excellence, Dr. King has won three previous teaching awards, including William & Mary's Thomas Jefferson Teaching Award and the Virginia State Council of Higher Education's Outstanding Faculty Award. She has published two books on anthropology, including The Information Continuum, Social Information Transfer in Monkeys, Apes, and Hominids. Professor King prepared the course guide that comes with these lectures. The course guide includes a detailed outline of each lecture, a glossary, species profiles, and an annotated bibliography. To get the most out of this course, you may find it useful to follow along with the outlines or review them before or after each lecture. Lecture 1, The Four Facets of Anthropology. Hello, and welcome to the Roots of Human Behavior. My name is Barbara King. I've been teaching biological anthropology at the College of William and Mary in Williamsburg, Virginia, since 1988. Over the next six hours, we'll be exploring together our closest living relatives in the animal world, the monkeys and apes. And more importantly, we're going to explore what these animals can tell us about ourselves, about the human species, and how we live our lives today. Over the course of the next lectures, we will meet, we meet monkeys who live in the wild and invent new dietary habits for themselves. We will meet apes who routinely solve problems in their daily lives by making and using tools. We will even meet a gorilla who, when asked in a human language what she might like for her birthday, replied, champagne. And we will meet a chimpanzee who lives in Africa who invented a toy for himself in the wild and carried it around with himself. Now, I study creatures like these for two reasons. One, they're fascinating animals in their own right. But secondly, we really think in anthropology that it is these closest living relatives in the animal world that can shed light on who we are. Biological anthropology does form the disciplinary context for this course. So in this first lecture, I'd like to tell you about biological anthropology, how it fits into the larger discipline of anthropology, and then introduce for you the anthropoid primates, the monkeys and apes and their relatives, and tell you about the nature of the link with these non-humans, with the human species. So let's start with anthropology. Unlike other disciplines, anthropology takes a comprehensive and holistic look at the human species. That is, anthropologists are interested in all kinds of angles on humanity. We study the human species prehistorically, before writing was invented. We also study human societies cross-culturally, across the globe, for a comparative context. And as I have already mentioned to you, we study humans compared with other selected species. Now, it is possible to have um, a department of anthropology, such as the one that I teach in, full of very diverse scholars coming at this study from very different angles. Let's take my own department at the College of William & Mary as an example. If you were to enter it from the main door, you would find the first office on the right is mine, a biological anthropologist. I have been studying monkeys and apes for over 20 years now. My particular interest is in cognition, how these animals think, and communication. I spent two and a half years living in Africa studying monkeys and apes, and I have spent um, many other years in captive settings in the United States, that is, major research zoos and research institutions. Now, if you were to continue down the hall, 
the very next office that you would come to, the office of my colleague, you would find an archaeologist, someone who digs in the country of Turkey and excavates past societies there. Further still down the hall, you would come upon a cultural anthropologist, someone who takes um, trips yearly to Malaysia, specifically to Borneo, to understand the life ways of people who live there today. Now, this really is a comprehensive approach. And I'd like to explain quite clearly that there are four linked subfields in anthropology. I've given you hints about their nature, but I want to more formally tell you their names and define them for you. If I go to a party or a reception and I mention, oh, I'm an anthropologist, often people will ask me as the first question, oh, where do you dig? There's an assumption that anthropologists dig in the ground to find out about human societies. And as I've mentioned, some of us do. This, by the way, may come from all the Indiana Jones movies. People assume that anthropologists are archaeologists. But in fact, the four subfields work together to form a coherent discipline. So let's start first with archaeology. Archaeology studies human behavior as it is reflected in material culture. Now that may be pottery or weapons or even entire houses, the study of whole communities. The focus is not so much on analyzing the artifact or the house itself, but rather on what that can tell us about human customs and human behavior. The place in which the archaeology uh, occurs may be Colonial Williamsburg, near where I live, 18th century archaeology. It may be ancient Greece. It may be even further back in time uh, done in Africa. The second subfield of anthropology is called cultural anthropology. And here, there's consideration of all the behavioral aspects of the human species that you could imagine. Belief systems, customs, life ways. Most people tend to imagine that cultural anthropologists go to exotic remote villages in the middle of Africa or Asia. And in fact, of course, that does happen. But just as frequently, anthropologists may study communities in the United States or even major corporations in the United States. Wherever there is a group of people working together in some kind of patterned way. Thirdly, there is linguistic anthropology. The subject matter of linguistic anthropology is, of course, language. How language changes over time, what patterns we see across human languages, and so forth. And lastly, of course, is biological anthropology. Now, we know this is the context for this course, and it is quite comprehensive in its own right. Biological anthropologists may study the genetics of modern human populations. They may study how modern groups adapt to different climate extremes, for example, very high altitude or very wet and humid conditions. And of course, the real locus of biological anthropology, the way that I study it, is the time period of human evolution and primate behavior, the behavior of our closest living relatives, the monkeys and apes. Now, there are two major related themes that undergird biological anthropology. First, we believe strongly that humans are best understood as biocultural beings. That is, we are influenced both by our biology, our anatomy, our genetics, our physiology, and also by our culture, the choices that we make, the way that we learn, the ideas that we hold. We are humans, unique and by virtue of our special abilities, but also we are anthropoid primates. This is the key concept for the course. Anthropoid primates are the monkeys, the apes, the direct human ancestors, and modern humans. It is very difficult to separate out biology and culture as two completely different spheres in biological anthropology. The way we try to understand the anthropoid primate adaptation is to bring the two of them together and approach it bioculturally. The second major point in biological anthropology is that in order to really understand ourselves, our place in the world today, we must understand the evolutionary link that we share with anthropoid primates. 
And that's what we're all about in this course. I should mention that the term anthropoid primates, as I said, is the key one. There are other types of primates alive in the world. There's a very small group of non-anthropoid primates. They are called prosimians. They evolved first. They are smaller and much less closely related to us. We are going to concentrate not on the prosimians, but rather on the anthropoids in this course. I urge you to read about prosimians. They are primates such as lemurs and lorises. They are part of this trend to study fascinating animals, but they are not particularly relevant to a Roots of Human Behavior course. Now, in order to really start getting into our subject matter, we have to start defining and explaining what it means to be an anthropoid, why anthropoids are a special, meaningful group, how they're different from these other primates that I just mentioned. And we can do this by approaching the topic first anatomically and second behaviorally. So let's start with the commonalities that anthropoids have anatomically. The first thing I want to discuss with you is the hand. A very um, key feature is the grasping hand, the ability to take fingers and move them independently to reach out and grasp a cup, a pencil, the hand of someone next to you, a doorknob. This is a fundamental adaptation of the anthropoids. Part of what allows for this grasping hand to have evolved is the fact that anthropoids have nails, not claws. We, of course, have fingernails and toenails, and all the monkeys and apes do as well. This allows for full independent manipulation and bringing together of the fingers in a grasp. Well, for the non-human anthropoids, the grasping hand allows for many things to happen. Infants, for example, can grasp right onto the mother's fur and cling right from birth. Monkeys and apes, when they climb trees, have a quick, easy way to cling onto the branches and move efficiently through the trees. The grasping hand is also important in object manipulation, and it is the basis of tool use as well. And we will see that some non-human anthropoids engage in tool use. The second anatomical feature that anthropoids have in common relates to the eyes. We, of course, are a good example of anthropoids. We have forward-facing eyes. This allows for overlapping fields of vision, and as a consequence, depth perception. The same is true of monkeys and apes. If you were to walk up to, let's say, a horse or a rabbit, you would notice that they have eyes on either side of the head, not forward-facing eyes, and they don't have the same degree of depth perception that anthropoids do. This is important for getting around in the trees and on the ground, for judging distances, and it is coupled with a very interesting adaptation for color vision. Anthropoids can discriminate colors, unlike, for example, your pet cat, your pet dog, most mammals. This is important in the forest. Different fruits may have different colors. Different leaves may, in fact, be different colors at different stages of maturity. Point number three, anatomically, is that anthropoids share a large and complex brain that allows for a significant amount of learning during their lives. Most scientists believe that anthropoids are the most intelligent creatures on Earth. Some think it's better to say among the most intelligent creatures on Earth, but either way, complicated learning patterns do occur in all the anthropoids. For example, we will see later on that some monkeys and apes remember the past and plan ahead for the future. Of course, we take it for granted that we humans do that, but it is not the case that humans can think back and ahead, but all animals cannot. Anthropoid primates share some of that ability with us. Let's switch now to talking about how anthropoids are united behaviorally, because really this is a course about behavior, not so much about anatomy. And again, we will go through three points. First is a commitment to social living. Anthropoids live in year-round coherent social groups. We call this sociality. Sociality is simply the fact that these animals are committed to social groups, and as we'll see in a minute, 
uh, their whole lives are focused around what happens in those social groups. Anthropoid sociality is fundamental to the entire um, scheme of behavior that we're going to be talking about. Now this isn't just uh, a case where animals come together because it's easier to scare off predators when you're together or easier to find food or easier to find mates. It goes deeper than that. And this brings us to the second point. There are social bonds in anthropoid groups. By this I mean close relationships between relatives and between other close associates. What this means is that these social groups that we're talking about, they're not just random collections of individuals. They are rather individuals that come together repeatedly, that interact with each other multiple times, and that have emotional ties with each other and shared histories. Now, I think that that phrase is so important that I'm going to repeat it. Anthropoids share with each other emotional ties and shared histories. That's quite a claim when you think that we're talking about non-humans, and it's one that I'm going to take some care to support as we go along in succeeding lectures. Now, point number three in terms of social adaptations is that these groups are set up to facilitate social learning and social communication patterns. We've already figured out that these animals are not just next to each other, not just proximate to each other, but they are meaningful to each other. And this in turn means that the animals take advantage of their emotional ties and their complex brains. They exchange information and they learn from each other. So we end up with a social group that is more than just the sum of its parts. And again, this is fundamental. So here we have common patterns in anthropoids. And I hope that this convinces you that the anthropoids really do make up a meaningful division of the animal kingdom. It means something, something it's held in common among anthropoids. But if we want to really understand the roots of human behavior, we have to go further than just to focus on the commonalities. commonalities. And we have to start distinguishing among different types of anthropoids. Now, in the beginning, this requires a lot of um, work on your part. We have to come to an understanding of a common vocabulary. And the place where I'm going to start doing this is to differentiate between monkeys and apes. Let's start with the monkeys. Monkeys are relatively small-bodied anthropoids. We can think, first of all, of a basic dog size and a basic dog body plan. Now, we don't want to push the analogy with a dog too far. And I hope you could tell me reasons already why we wouldn't want to. Dogs don't have grasping hands. Dogs don't have large, complex brains. But they are mammals, and for the moment, they suit our purposes. They are the right size, and they have equal length, arms and legs, and a tail, all of which is true for monkeys. The size variety in dogs works pretty well to describe the size variety in monkeys. You may have wandered into a pet shop or seen at a fair or a festival a small organ grinder's monkey. These are small-bodied animals with long, curly tails. This is sort of at the small uh, size range. For larger monkeys, you might think of baboons. But they all have in common the fact that they walk along the top of whatever substrate they're on. If they're on the ground, they just walk with their equal length arms and legs along. If they climb up in the trees, as they often will, they walk along the tops of the branches. This becomes important in a minute when we contrast it with what apes do. So for the moment, please think of some monkeys living entirely in the trees, some making use of the trees and also the ground. But whenever they're in the trees, think of them walking on the tops of the branches. Now let's shift to apes. Apes are larger almost in every case than monkeys. They can be quite large, several hundred pounds. They have a very different body plan than monkeys do. They are adapted not just to walk along the tops of branches, or not to do that at all, in fact, they're too heavy, but rather to hang beneath branches and swing through the trees, arm over arm, arm, over arm hand over hand. Now, they're adapted to do this because their body plan is different. They have very flexible joints at the shoulder, the elbow, and the wrist. They have no tail. 
they have longer arms than legs, and their arms are kind of ending in a hand that's a hook-like shape to grab on. They have a different center of gravity entirely than monkeys. So they get around differently, and they have a whole different look, if you will. This reminds me that for the last 20 years, I've been working on a project that I must say has met with very little success. And it is the project to convince American elementary schools to rename all their monkey bars on their playgrounds as ape bars. Because you put a monkey up there, and it's not going to do very well. Monkey bars are these parallel metal bars where you can swing beneath them, and kids are very good at doing this. Apes would be very good at doing this. Sorry, monkeys are not very good at doing this. However, no one's listened to me so far. Now, the key thing that I'd like you to remember at this point in contrasting monkeys and apes, in addition to what I've told you, is that apes are our closest living relatives, are more closely related to humans than are monkeys. This is very important. For any course that is relating anthropoids to humans, you would understand why it would be. It is for biological anthropologists, and thus for our students, a cardinal sin to confuse monkeys and apes. Many of the models that have been used to understand the evolution of the human species rely very much on the apes because they are so closely related to us. Now, um, when I say closely related to us, I am talking about, in all the cases of the great apes, sharing upwards of 95% of our genetic material. This reaches 98% in some of the apes. It is also um, emphasizing behavioral similarities, chromosomal and molecular similarities, any type of similarity that you would want to examine the apes are closer to us. A good example of an ape is a chimpanzee. We'll be talking about chimpanzees a lot in succeeding lectures. But this is probably a good time to insert a kind of caveat or a warning. Even though the chimp, chimpanzee, is so closely related to us, we are not trying to suggest that, in fact, the similarities are so strong that chimps are really just furry people who happen to hang beneath branches. We are not trying to suggest that humans are just upright walking chimpanzees. The relationship is much more complicated than that. It's not a one-to-one -one relationship in that way. And that really is my job in this course, is to explain to you why we don't think in that one-to-one -one way. And I will do that. Now, if I were to stop here in differentiating anthropoids for you, that would be wrong. It's, we're not just talking about monkeys and apes. We need to remember that the direct ancestors of humans and we ourselves are anthropoids. Now, the topic of human evolution is not a theme in this course, but I will consider it in one lecture. The time period of human evolution is usually taken to extend from about four or five million years ago clear up through about 30,000 years ago. Now, I don't mean to say that human evolution has stopped. It hasn't. We're still evolving. But rather that, in terms of an academic subject, when you get a textbook or hear a series of lectures, we talk about those two dates as kind of bounding the changes that we want to understand. And between about four or five million years ago, and 30,000 years ago, we can trace the evolution of upright walking, the first stone tools that have ever been found, the control of fire, the control of hunting of other species, a cave art, and other types of paintings and art. And all of these things we will touch on as part of understanding the roots of human behavior. But of course, we'll concentrate on the monkeys and apes and relating them to our species. The first um, point that I want to make in clarifying the relationship between monkeys and apes and humans is this one. It's been understood since the time of Charles Darwin in the mid-19th century. You know that Charles Darwin is the co-creator of the theory of evolution, and he understood this very clearly. The relationship between humans and apes or in fact between humans and any other non-human anthropoid, is one of common ancestry. Another way to say this 
is to say that humans did not evolve directly from monkeys and apes. Here we have another absolutely crucial point to understand. This is a myth that humans evolved from monkeys and apes. And let me tell you first about the myth. The myth is that you get an ape, again, let's use the chimpanzee as an example, and you learn about it and study it and you figure out what it's all about, and then you kind of think of it as being alive millions of years ago, but put it in your mind into a kind of a tunnel. And throughout this tunnel is a long period of human evolution, and things happen, changes occur. Step by step, what you get over time is transformation of this chimpanzee so that at the end, what you pop out with is a human. A linear progression over time. Wrong. That is wrong. What is accurate to say is that humans and chimpanzees shared a common ancestor. Well, what does that mean? It means that as far as we, biological anthropologists, can tell, at about six million years ago, there were no humans in the world and no chimpanzees in the world. So imagine, please, if you can, a forest in Africa and one single undifferentiated creature alive at that time. It is neither human nor chimpanzee. It is a generalized type of anthropoid ape. It may live dispersed over a fairly wide geographical range. And at some point in its evolutionary history, what we call a split point, there is, in fact, a splitting of this group into two different evolutionary lineages. One of them evolves and becomes humans. The other evolves and becomes chimpanzees. Common ancestor splits into two different directions. Now, this process happened over and over again multiple times throughout anthropoid evolution. The chimpanzee example is just that. Now, clearly, this is going to raise a question in your minds. And the question that I would predict you'd be thinking is, well, why? What would cause such a split point? For a full treatment of this question, I would recommend reading a good biological anthropology text. And I've recommended one for you in the written material that accompanies this lecture. But to give you a very quick idea, and to return again to the ideas of Charles Darwin, who understood this, Darwin focused on different environmental pressures that pushed the group to split and evolve in two different directions. Let's return to this notion of a common undifferentiated ancestor living over a fairly wide range of space in Africa. You might have in the western part of this area certain fruit available to eat, certain predators, certain climate, certain disease patterns. Way over here in the east, you might have the same climate patterns, but slightly different food available, different predators. Microclimates may differ. In any case, you've got some differences environmentally. Over time, then, the organisms over here start adapting in various ways to their own environment. The organisms over here start adapting in a slightly different direction. And over time, through a very complicated mixture of genetic process and environmental change, you end up getting a split into two different lineages. Now, I offer apologies to biologists because that was quick, and the details will be explained for you in a textbook if you'd like to pursue them. What's important for our purposes is the outcome, the fact that these two lineages can and do split. And when this happens repeatedly, you end up with the whole diversity and whole array of anthropoid species that we find today. Now, let's look back just a little bit about what we've talked about in this first lecture. What biological anthropology is asking us to do is to think of ourselves, yes, as unique human beings, as unique biocultural beings, but also be willing to step back from that admitted uniqueness and to say that we're anthropoids as well to begin to look at how we really relate, and not only anatomically, but behaviorally, to those monkeys and apes in the world. The suggestion is that we need to take as a fundamental concept the fact of evolution, the fact of our common ancestry, 
with these other primates. This is an accepted concept in biological anthropology. It is certainly um, true that in America, some people still find it uh, something they reject. They don't believe in, in evolution and, and wish to reject that common ancestry. This was absolutely true in Darwin's time in the 19th century. But in biological anthropology, it is our working concept. It is taken, evolution happened, we don't know all the details, but that is our starting point. And what we want to do then is to go on from here and to begin to start looking at, let's say, anthropoid sociality. What are the nature of those emotional ties and shared histories? How can we begin to unpack anthropoid sociality and to begin to ask how we relate to what monkeys and apes do socially? We will pick up in the next lecture this question of anthropoid sociality. Lecture two, social bonds and family ties. Welcome back. In the second lecture, we will explore anthropoid sociality, specifically the makeup of anthropoid social groups, and what it might be like for an individual monkey and ape to experience life in those groups. Before we get into this, though, I'd like to set the scene for you just a little bit by telling you where monkeys and apes are found in the world today. Geographically, monkeys and apes are distributed in tropical and semi-tropical regions of the world, fairly close to the equator. Now this is the pattern. Of course there are exceptions, as there will be to many of the points that I make. We are going to work on the level of patterns here. An exception that you might be able to think of is the Japanese snow monkey. Many of us have seen documentaries about these animals that live in snowy areas of Asia. But for the most part we're talking about tropical adapted animals. About 90% of the monkeys and apes living today live in forests. This is an extremely forest adapted type of creature we're talking about. Later on in the course, I want to explore the ramifications of that adaptation for the lives of monkeys and apes today. We know that we are losing many acres of forest annually to habitat destruction and particularly to logging. And this is of extreme concern to primatologists, those who study monkeys and apes because of what it means for our subjects and the lives of those animals. Anthropoids, non-humans of course, are found in Africa and Asia, also in South America, Central America, and Southern Mexico. So with the exception of that southern part of Mexico, we do not have monkeys and apes in North America. This is interesting because in fact one of the areas of anthropoid evolution early on, millions and millions of years ago, was North America. But these early forms went extinct, and of course, with the exception of humans, we don't have anthropoids in North America today, forcing us, who study them, to take long plane trips or to work in captivity in the United States. Now, it is a basic fact, as you've already learned, that monkeys and apes live in year-round social groups. The idea of a solitary anthropoid is very much a contradiction in terms. What we want to do is talk a bit about how these social groups vary in terms of their arrangements and their makeup. If there's any rule that I can set out as invariant at the start, it's that all social groups have dependent offspring in them. They better, or else the species in question would be in danger of going extinct. By dependent offspring, I mean infants and juveniles. Infants are, of course, the youngest animals, the ones that are still suckling using mother's milk as their major form of nutrition. And juveniles are those infants that have been weaned. They've moved past infancy. They're post-weaning. But they are not yet fully adult, and they are not yet fully mating as adults. So every group has dependent offspring. But beyond this core, there really is no typical pattern. There's no typical monkey social organization or typical ape social organization. Now this in itself is a significant finding. Forty years ago, when the study of primatology in this country was really taking off, 
there were many attempts to find, to isolate a typical monkey social organization, to identify it. But there's so much variation that we now know that that cannot be done. Let's consider the monkeys and the smallest of the apes together for a moment. The smallest of the apes are Asian apes. They live in Asia, and they are called the gibbons and the siamangs. At this point, I'd like to suggest that you consult in your booklet the species sketches as I'm talking during the second lecture. I'll be giving you a lot of names of different types of monkeys and apes, and that written material is meant to help you straighten them out as we go along. So monkeys, gibbons, and siamangs, what is the range of social organization shown in these species? Well, first of all, at the smaller, more contained end of the range, you have extended family groups, um, uh, mother and father together with the dependent offspring, and perhaps, as well as the youngest infants and juveniles, another generation of older siblings that might have stayed around, but still a fairly small group carving out a small part of the forest for a territory. At the other end of the extreme, and this is um, typical of some monkeys, much larger groups, 100, 150, with multiple males, multiple females, and lots of dependent offspring. Now, the numbers that I gave you, 100 and a little bit more, are not at all uncommon for some monkey groups. But quite recently, a rather astonishing find was made in West Africa, what we call supergroups of monkeys that number up to 500, really coherent groups that stay together. So even after all these decades of study, we're still surprising ourselves by what we find in terms of the diversity of social organization. Now let's confine ourselves to talking about monkeys for just a minute, and even more specifically than that, a certain type of monkey. Examples of the types of species I'm talking about here are baboons, macaques, and vervets. All of these monkeys, which live in Africa and Asia, live in multiple male, multiple female gatherings with dependent offspring. Not 500 of them, but let's say 60, 80, 100. These are among the best studied anthropoid groups of all. In all of them, there's a common pattern. Right after the juvenile period and before adulthood, one sex leaves the group into which it was born. And in all these species, that's the male. The male leaves at about puberty and mates in another group and stays in that group, or indeed may transfer on elsewhere, for its entire life. What this means, then, is that there's a breaking of bonds during this period of dispersal and after for the males. But conversely, the females stay in their natal groups. They tend to build up, if you will, families of relatives, female relatives, grandmothers, mothers, aunts, sisters, all kinds of female relatives. And we'll be talking a lot more about this difference between the sexes and how it plays out in other anthropoid primates later. That gives you some idea of what the monkeys may be organized like. Other monkeys are organized differently. We are going to concentrate a great deal in this course on what are called the great apes. These exclude the smaller apes I just talked about, and they involve four types of apes. The orangutan, the gorilla, the bonobo, and the chimpanzee. And I'm going to describe their so social organization for you one by one. The orangutan is the large great ape of Asia. It is the only great ape in Asia. It is red colored. This is an interesting case because some decades ago, the assumption was made based on initial field work that this was the case of a solitary anthropoid. It seemed as if, for the most part, and with the exception of mothers and infants traveling together, animals traveled singly and alone. In recent years, though, we figured out that the situation is more complex and that it is not correct to call the orangutan a solitary ape. In addition to dependent offspring traveling with their mothers, of course the adult males and females come together to mate, but they may stay together for some days. There may be small groups of juveniles that form and stay together. And beyond that, 
depending on where one studies in Asia, there may be more gregariousness, more sociability in some places than others, with groupings of orangs feeding in the same tree, for example. All of the other three types of great apes are from Africa, and we'll consider first gorillas. We know that gorillas live in groups that are controlled by either one or two males, and there may be something like six or eight or more, it varies, adult females and their dependent offspring in this group. Again, there's been a shift in our understanding over the years in this social organization. We used to think that the invariant social organization was a one male group, a big male gorilla called a silverback, because as they age, adult males get silver fur on their back, was thought to control females and offspring across the board. Now, in one area of Africa, the area where Diane Fossey studied, many of you may have heard of her and know her book, Gorillas in the Mist, 40% of gorilla groups actually have two adult males. That's a high percentage. We are beginning to study other types of gorillas in West Africa, and they too seem to have slightly different social organization. So we're still unpacking the, the variant nature of gorilla groups. The next two great apes are closely related to each other. We know they're African. They are the chimpanzee and the bonobo. The bonobo you may have heard of called the pygmy chimpanzee. It's one and the same form. We will use the term bonobo. There are a lot of similarities between the ways that chimpanzees and bonobos set up their social groups. They live in what are called communities. Multiple males, multiple females, and dependent offspring, but not like what we talked about with those monkey species, the baboons, macaques, and vervets. Here there's a difference. The community is made up of smaller, very fluid parties. Six or eight chimpanzees may travel together for a while. Two may go in a different direction. They may be joined by three more who may stay together for an hour. A lot of fluidity, a lot of change in party membership. Why are we concentrating on the great apes? Simply because they are our closest living relatives in the entire animal kingdom. And this brings up a point that I think I should emphasize that this course is not a primatology course. It does not give equal weight to, let's say, the small monkeys of South America and to the great apes. A straightforward primatology course might well do that and tell you about all of their adaptations. Because we're interested in roots of human behavior, I have selected some species. And this is um, an interaction between the work that I know best and the fact that biological anthropologists tend to emphasize just these species when we talk about humans. You would get a very different course from a different anthropologist, I assure you, but we are going to stick with the animals that illuminate our species the most. All right, so far I've told you there's a lot of diversity in social organization, but we really need to work according to patterns. So how can we extract any patterns from all this chaotic diversity that we've talked about? I will tell you about four factors that together can be said to define an individual monkey or ape's experience of living in a social group. These four factors are age, sex, presence of relatives in the group, and relative ranking or status. Now clearly one's age affects how one is treated in the group. We know this from our own lives and it's just as true with monkeys and apes. For the most part, monkey and ape infants are born with some kind of badge or marker of their special infant status. This may be a white tail tuft, different coat color entirely compared to adults, big pink ears that stick out from the head, something that proclaims, I'm an infant. And during this time period, to a certain degree, there's protection, if you will, from a great deal of punishment. I don't want to go too far with this. I mean, infants can't get away with anything, but there's um, a leniency shown often towards infants. To give you an example, um, I have been working with gorillas at the National Zoological Park in Washington, and these gorillas live a rich social life in a group of relatives. Occasionally, altercations break out. This is quite normal. This does not injure the animals in any way. It's just part of their lives. 
Recently, I witnessed a fight between the large adult silverback male and a sub-adult male. And they were posturing and threatening, and there was a little bit of an attack going on. And a very young animal, who is a juvenile more than an infant, launched himself at this big male, the several hundred pound big male, trying to defend the sub-adult, and just kept throwing himself into the middle of this fight. Clearly, the size differential and the power differential was great here. The silverback male could have attacked him and silenced him very easily. And he didn't choose to do that. He just flung out an arm and kind of got rid of the juvenile and, and sloughed him off as an irritant. The second factor is sex. Being male or female clearly helps define one's experience in a social group. A good example relates back to that process I mentioned earlier with monkeys. The fact that in many monkeys, males leave the group and mate elsewhere. Females stay and cement their bonds with female relatives. Well, interestingly enough, in bonobos and chimpanzees, apes, the process of dispersal or transfer happens just in the reverse. Females leave at puberty and males stay. And in each case, you'll be able to imagine that the experience of life differs very much according to sex. Closely related to the second point is my third, the presence of relatives or kin in one's social group has a big influence on what happens. Kin, of course, don't always cooperate. There may be conflict between them, but they are ready and at least potential sources of support and alliance. They may be grooming partners. Anthropoids, uh, non-human anthropoids, engage in slow picking through each other's fur not only for hygienic reasons, but for bonding and calming and relaxing. All of these positive, affiliative things tend to happen more among relatives. And of course, if you are part of the sex that has not transferred out, you will be surrounded by your kin. The last factor is relative rank or status. Many, although not all, anthropoid social groups are arranged with dominance hierarchies. What that means is that some animals have a higher ranking, that is, a better ability to get resources when resources are limited. They are able to outcompete others, get better food or shelter or fertile mates. If you are a high-ranking ape, your life may be easier in some ways because of better access to resources. If you are a low-ranking animal, your life may be very different. The trick for the biological anthropologist going to study these animals is beginning to tease out these factors and try to see how they together affect the lives of individuals. And you can probably guess at this point that it's very important for anthropologists to individually identify our subjects. When we go in to study a social group, we want to know who's there. If we're just starting with a new group, that can take many years but we try to build up who might be kin to who, and we try to understand the relationship of rank and age and sex. And that's a, a big part of anthropological life in the field, studying anthropoid primates. So we already know that there are social bonds going on in these social groups, and let's talk about that a little bit more. The strongest social bonds, as I've hinted for you already, are often found between kin, between relatives. Mother-infant bond, for example, is extremely strong in anthropoid primates. This, in fact, is the subject of the entire third lecture. This is not surprising. Anybody who studies mammals will automatically expect a strong social bond between infants and their mothers. It is also true that siblings will bond with each other, brothers and sisters, brothers and brothers, sisters and sisters. These bonds can be expressed through grooming, play, protection, sometimes through sharing of resources. I remember an anecdote that occurred during my field work with baboons in Kenya that first brought home to me the importance of sibling-sibling bonds. There was a very low-ranking male called Bonk who could not compete as well as the other males for access to resources. And one day he simply snatched up a young infant, one we had named Nick, put Nick on his belly and went striding off with Nick to encounter another male. This is the idea of using an infant as a buffer 
to reduce whatever threats or aggression might come from other males who are reluctant to injure infants. Well, this is all well and good for Bonk, but Nick may not have been so happy. Judging by his facial expressions and his vocalizations, he was feeling distressed. At that point, I watched his slightly older sister come and monitor the interaction and wait until Nick was released by the older male. And she immediately ran to him, hugged him, and they sat in an embrace for quite some time, apparently calming Nick down. That was a very strong example of a sibling bond. In certain cases, in certain groups, grandparent-grandchild bonds may exist. Father-infant relationships may exist. I have minimized talking about father-infant relationships for several reasons. It's quite difficult for us to know paternity in many of the social groups that we study. There are multiple males, multiple females, multiple matings. We don't always know who the father is. And furthermore, the expression of frequent paternal care seems fairly rare in non-human anthropoids. To give you an example of a monkey in which it does occur, I can think of the marmoset of South America, a small tree-living monkey. In this case, the female routinely gives birth to twins. These twins may equal 25% of her body weight at birth, which is a statistic I, as a mother, don't want to think about for too long. And the father is the one who routinely transports the infants. The mother, of course, nurses them. The father does a great deal of paternal care, related, no doubt, to this twinning effect. Evidence shows that these kin relationships are meaningful to the monkeys and apes themselves. I will give data to support this in later lectures, but we now know that this isn't just something that we, the anthropologist, comes into the group and imposes. Rather, the kinship relationships and the kinship bonds appear to be quite meaningful. And the example that I gave with Nick and his sister in the baboon group may back that up. Now, non-relatives certainly may also show social bonds. Non-related monkeys and apes may join together in alliances. They may be grooming partners. The bonobos that I mentioned earlier, apes of Africa, for example, unrelated females in this species form very strong social bonds with very important implications that we'll discuss later for social organization. So it's not the case that there are never social bonds between non-relatives. Now, we've talked a lot about conclusions that we've reached about social organization, but this leaves unanswered still a fairly big topic, and it's one I want to embark on now. How do we, as researchers, as anthropologists, try to analyze, understand and analyze these social bonds? We've been making the claim that emotional ties exist that shared histories exist. Well, if we see that, how do we talk about that? How do we know that we're really seeing what we think we're seeing and what language do we use to describe that? Some researchers embrace what is called anthropomorphism for explaining emotional ties and shared history. Anthropomorphism is the attribution of human characteristics to animals. So if you are studying a group of apes and you say, look, that ape is jealous of his brother, that's an anthropomorphic statement. If you're working with monkeys and you say, oh, look how joyful this young monkey is in its play today, that's also an anthropomorphic statement. Those who embrace and use anthropomorphism accept the idea that these monkeys and apes we've been talking about think. They solve problems, they have cognition, they remember some of the past, plan ahead. They accept the idea that these monkeys and apes express emotion. And they accept the idea furthermore that because these are our closest living relatives, we can safely assume, if we see behavior to indicate it, that they feel similarly as we do. A prominent example of a user and defender of anthropomorphism is Jane Goodall. Jane Goodall is, of course, a world-renowned expert on chimpanzees. She has studied these apes in Tanzania starting in 1960. So she is uh, into her, what, fifth decade at this point of study. She talks, for example, about chimpanzees experiencing grief at the death of a loved one. 
A good example that she's given to back up this claim involves a very famous chimpanzee called Flo. This is an adult female chimpanzee who lived at the research site Jane Goodall worked at in Tanzania. Now, as an aside, I should tell you that Flo died in 1972, so Jane Goodall knew her for over a decade. And when she did die, the major newspaper in England, in London, published her obituary. So this was the first time, and to my knowledge, the only time that the major London paper did such a thing for an ape. Flo was um, a super mom. She was an efficient, caring, loving, protective mother who gave birth to five offspring. And her last surviving offspring was called Flint. She had a particularly close relationship with him. This was a little male. And at some point, she just got old. When she got old and died, she still was very, very close with Flint. And what Goodall describes is that at her death, Flint simply went into a decline. He appeared to be what we would call depressed. He stopped eating. And he himself died. According to Goodall, part of the reason that he did was grief. And she does not qualify that. She simply says that it was grief. And she says that she used her observational powers to come up with that conclusion. Now, Goodall did not pioneer the use of anthropomorphism. Even before 1960, researchers in Japan came to conclusions that were start quite startling to Western scientists. They claimed that the monkeys they were studying, Japanese macaques in their own country, had personalities, could be differentiated according to their personalities, and would routinely speak about their society, their personality, their unique individuality. This was very, very new, a new perspective for any scientist in the West who was starting to study monkeys. It was very rejected as a point of view by Western scientists. It might not surprise any of you who know a little bit about Japan, as I do, just a little bit, about the Eastern philosophy that such um, a perspective on animals would come out of there. There is not such a rigid dichotomy in many Asian perspectives between humans and other animals as there is in the West. So their idea, um, anthropomorphic thinking about monkeys, was quite natural. Well, Jane Goodall and others picked up on this. And since that time, anthropomorphism has been used by many scientists of excellent reputation, again, to argue that because we're dealing with animals so closely similar to us, this is a safe assumption. Now, other scientists out and out disagree and reject the use of anthropomorphism. Critics point out that we cannot get into the minds or the hearts of monkeys and apes. We certainly cannot interview them. How do we know what they're feeling? And how do we know that grief for an ape is like our grief, if indeed it exists at all? These critics charge that anthropomorphism leads to projecting human qualities onto monkeys and apes. And in fact, these animals may differ appreciably from us. So they consider it to be a dangerous practice. Let me give you another example that might highlight some of the objections that critics have. Sometimes mothers, monkeys and apes, when they give birth, will have a stillborn birth. Or shor shortly after the infant is born, the infant will become ill and die. Maybe it will be one day or two days old. The mother often, although not always, always, will carry the corpse with her for days. She may stop and put it down to feed, but then she will pick it up, clutch it tightly to her, move through the savanna or move through the forest with it. I have seen this myself with Kenyan baboons. An anthropomorphic explanation would be that she feels a sadness does not want to give up the body of her infant, has an attachment that she cannot break. Critics, of course, would say, how do you know that? How do you know it may not be something completely different? Perhaps the mother does not understand death and simply does not know what to make of the lifeless body that she's carrying with her and is just carrying it around. This debate has been going on for some time and shows no sign of abating. Let's look back at what all of this discussion 
about anthropoid sociality, both the facts and how we analyze anthropoid sociality, what does all this mean for roots of human behavior? Well, it means that before we humans even evolved, there was in place fundamental sociality, real reliance on group cohesion, group living, and social bonds. The emotion that gets expressed is part of everyday life. This may vary according to individual experience, but it is absolutely key. We humans are anthropoids. We humans are social. And this is something that we have gotten from our evolutionary legacy. We'll continue looking at specific forms of such sociality in the next lecture. Lecture 3, The Journey Away from Mom. Let's continue now with our exploration of anthropoid sociality. In the last lecture, we explored the fact that there's an incredible diversity of social organizations among the monkeys and apes, but we identified also some common patterns in the expression of emotional ties, social bonds between relatives, and the like. There are a few things that I can say without qualification in this course applying to all anthropoid primates. But one thing that I can say without qualification is that the mother-infant relationship is by far the strongest example of emotional attachment in any monkey or ape species. The period of infancy and the period of attachment that mothers and infants feel for each other lasts many months or many years, depending on the type of creature we're talking about. Let's talk about great apes for a moment. Great apes have fairly long lives in the wild. They may live till their 30s or 40s. And the interval of time between a female giving birth to successive infants ranges from four to eight years. That means that the period of infancy for a great ape is typically four or five years. And during this period, the infant is quite dependent on the mother in a variety of ways, certainly in the beginning, dependent on her for milk and nutrition, for transport being carried, and emotionally and socially. For monkeys, the period of infancy is not as long. The overall lifespan of monkeys is not as long. An infant may um, depend on its mother nutritionally for a year or even less, depending on the species, and the period of infancy will be over before two years. Again, these are just generalizations. So another way to put this is that there is a positive relationship between the closeness of a species to humans and the length of its infancy period. Now, anthropoid infants are born relatively undeveloped compared to most mammals. You know that in some mammals, let's take, for example, giraffes or antelopes, the infant is born and within hours can travel behind the mother, keep up with the social group, keep up with the herd, and have its senses working and be relatively ready to go, as it were. This is not quite the case with anthropoid infants, but anthropoids are born ready to cling to the mother's fur. This is something I mentioned back in our first lecture in relationship to the grasping hand. This is a reflex. As soon as the monkey or ape is born, it clings on with its two hands, its two feet, and the mother transports it that way. She may, of course, use an arm for support on occasion if the infant gets tired or is weak at birth. But basically, it is the infant's responsibility to cling. Now, at first, the infant travels ventrally on the mother's ventrum on her belly. And this may go on for some months, again, depending upon the species. The mother may have to move quite quickly to keep up with the group. Let's say the group is escaping a predator or some danger and the group is running. The infant is clinging on the mother's belly and they're both running together. As the infants develop, they switch from riding ventrally to riding dorsally on the mother's back. And in the monkeys that I studied in Africa, this looked a little bit like having a jockey up on the monkey's back. The infant would sit straight up at the end of her back near the tail 
and ride around that way and be able to observe the world as she went. It is also the case that infants may ride dorsally on their older siblings for a while, even in some rare cases, other animals. In the case of a dorsal ride, you may see a mother or an older sibling slinging its arm back and helping the infant get up there. The infant may clamber up on his or her own. Anthropoid infants, in any case, are rarely apart from their mothers during the initial stages of infancy. There are exceptions. There are some species in which a behavior called infant sharing is practiced. In this case, quite shortly after birth, the mother voluntarily hands over the infant, passes it around. Different adults um, and also some subadult females will take turns holding it. This is a very special type of adaptation that's confined to only a few species. The typical rule is that the mother is relatively protective with the infant. And we will talk about these cases. The infant's social world then only gradually broadens out from that of his mother. Initially, because of this intense physicality of the relationship between the mother and the infant, whatever happens to the mother happens to the infant. The animals that approach the mother approach the infant, and that is the sum total of the infant's life. The infant and the mother might be best thought of as a unit in these very early weeks and months. It may be the case, for example, that this mother-infant unit is a kind of magnet of social attraction in the social group. That is, other adults and animals of all ages may come up and want to touch, explore, inspect the infant. And in some cases, the rank of the mother may rise as a result of merely having an infant. She may be so much the center of attention that she's able to get uh, other resources, more resources than she normally would. Certainly, um, the mother-infant unit, and the infant in particular, is a magnet for older sisters, what we call in anthropology the aunts. And now this is not a biological aunt, but rather a babysitter type of aunt. It's called aunting behavior, where the older sister will take care of the infant. And the first time that the older sister tries to do this may be rather comical. Never having experienced an infant, the older sister may try to take it and carry it, and it's you know carrying the infant upside down and fumbling around with it, and the infant is thrashing, and all these things go on. But this is a way for the older sister, the so-called aunt, to get experience before she herself has her own baby. Now, gradually, the infant is weaned. That means that over time, the mother begins to reject it from the breast, and it has to begin, well, it's already supplementing its diet, but it has to really rely now on other types of food rather than mother's milk. Weaning is most definitely not an event. It doesn't happen in a day or a week. It's a process. It happens gradually. The mother may at first begin to condition the infant to when it should suckle, perhaps when the mother is resting or grooming or doing something relatively quiet, not, in other words, when she's traveling quickly or climbing up a tree to feed or doing something that requires energy and coordination. As the weaning proceeds, then the time period may become narrower and narrower, narrower in which the infant is allowed to suckle. Now you shouldn't think that the infant is just sitting back and accepting all this without protest because there is a phenomenon that we call the weaning tantrum that characterizes many, not all, anthropoid infants. If you've ever seen a human toddler in the full throes of a tantrum, this will give you some clue as to what I'm talking about. A human toddler, you can imagine, just throwing itself on the ground. Well, Infant monkeys, for example, at Amboseli National Park in Kenya, where I've worked, will also, if they're frustrated and unable to suckle, throw themselves on the ground, vocalize, thrash their limbs, protest this process of weaning, where the mother is slowly distancing herself from the infant. But as the weaning proceeds and is eventually accomplished, then, the infant's social world, too, begins to broaden around it. The infant begins to seek out her own companions instead of just interacting with the mothers. And peers, same age infants, maybe juveniles too, a little older, begin to play an important role in the life of the infant. The weaning process, as I mentioned, uh, may be accomplished not until three or four years in a great ape, and much more quickly in a monkey. 
Now, recall, please, the four factors that we talked about in the last lecture that experience, that impact an individual's experience of life in the group. These are sex and age and relatives and relative ranking. Well, they also impact the lives of infants and juveniles as much as they do of adults. Sex and age, for instance, interact to determine whether a youngster will stay in the group into which it's born. Here we're going to revisit the topic of transfer or dispersal that I have hinted at before. In almost all anthropoids, one sex, or in some cases both sexes, disperse out of its group at the time of puberty. Now why would this occur? We've mentioned it, but we haven't talked much about it. One reason may be to avoid inbreeding with relatives. We know that um, there may be deleterious genetic effects of breeding with relatives. And all that you need evolutionarily is a single transfer of one sex out of its natal group, the group into which it's born, to avoid this problem. You get either the male or the female mating in a neighboring group, and you're avoiding all of those relatives. However, this is unlikely to be the full reason for why transfer or dispersal occurs, because we know that in many cases, individual monkeys or apes may make multiple transfers in their lifetime, which would not be required if the only evolutionary function was to avoid inbreeding. Another reason may simply be to improve access to resources. Let's say you're a relatively low-ranking animal about to come up to adulthood, and you want to better your lot, let's say, in terms of getting food, fertile mates. One possibility is to simply transfer. The period of dispersal may be, need not be, but may be traumatic and dangerous for the young animal that has to leave. It is not necessarily a foregone conclusion that that second group, the one into which the animal is trying to transfer, will welcome it with open arms. If we're talking about, let's say, a young male baboon, a monkey in Africa, transferring from its group into a neighboring group, well, you might find that the adult males already in that group do not welcome it. After all, this could be a rival and a competitor for other resources. So the process of dispersal can involve long time periods of males, let's say, hanging around the periphery of the new group, perhaps trying to make an ally at that periphery, making um, friends, if you will, pardon the anthropomorphism, with a female, grooming her, perhaps with a younger animal, trying to find a way to get into that group. The dispersal may or may not be successful, and then, if it is not, the animal may try again later. In any case, the dispersing monkey or ape's life changes dramatically. And for our topic in this lecture, for the mother-infant bond, it certainly has dramatic consequences. Because the animal that leaves the natal group, as far as we know, rarely, if ever, returns. So therefore, has left the mother behind. By the way, again, to, to look at things from the point of view of the researcher, the anthropologist, this person is quite interesting. Uh, again, I'll use as an example my study of baboons in Kenya. And every morning when I was studying the baboons, the first thing, first trick, was to find them. If I had been with them the day before, I knew which tree they were sleeping in, which tree they had ascended, and I could be there at the bottom of it first thing in the morning, and census them as they come down from the tree, make sure everybody's there and healthy. On some mornings, inevitably, not many, but some, I would find that there was a male missing. And what could that mean? It was very hard to know. The first thing to do would be to search, sadly, for a carcass. There are predator attacks. Deaths do occur. If such a carcass was not found, then it would be an open question. Could the male have transferred out? Again, transfers are relatively rare, but they do happen. And if you're suddenly missing a male, the best thing to do is to try to census the neighboring groups. And you may then be able to track where that male went. Okay, um, and of course the same is true when you are studying a group and you see in the distance through your binoculars a male hanging around that you don't recognize trying to come into the group. And in fact, on those days, I would return um, to the research hut not wanting to act as an impediment to that possible transfer. All the monkeys that I worked with were quite used to 
starting their mornings with having a jeep door open and a woman come out with a check sheet and binoculars, but this new male didn't think that that was a normal situation and, and would leave if, if I hadn't left. Now, um, the mother-infant relationship is our focus and we want to get back to talking about it a little bit more directly. We are going to consider a way in which the mother-infant relationship can be studied and viewed to better understand it and to better make some parallels with human families and human bonds. This way um, of looking at the infancy and the relationship between infants and adults is what I call looking at the behavior that results as jointly active and jointly dynamic, both partners active and changing the other as the interaction unfolds. Now I want to oppose this first to the more traditional way of looking at infancy and mother-infant interactions. The traditional way has been to consider the infant as relatively passive. This is more in the past, a couple of decades ago, but still tends to linger in some of the literature. It is changing. But the infant was seen for a long time as absorbing lessons from its mother, from other relatives and associates that were older and in some way more knowledgeable. The emphasis in this view is thus on socialization, this process of developing into a mature group member. In this case, the infant is seen as more or less an empty receptacle to be filled up. Things happen to the infant. It is taught, guided, punished, protective, and eventually the infant transforms into an adult member of the group. Now, by contrast, newer research emphasizes instead an active, dynamic infant. In this case, the infant is seen right from birth, from really the earliest hours, to participate jointly with the mother and its other associates in shaping its own social world. To get the idea of this, to think, please, of a human baby and having an interaction with, let's say, a six-month-old. And you know that these babies are quite capable of turn-taking, not conversation, of course, they don't have words yet, but if you speak to them, they will babble or coo or smile, but they'll do so with appropriate pauses when you speak. You can have a back and forth. They have mutual gaze with you. They will smile. And what the baby does will partly determine what you do. It is not only that what you do determines what the baby does. It is mutual. This is easy to see with humans, sometimes less easy to see with non-human anthropoids, but I believe it is a very important parallel in infant development across anthropoid primates. Now, my recent research, in fact, my research for quite a few years, has focused on this idea of how to really describe the infant and the mother together, or the infant and other relatives together, as constituting mutually dynamic interactions. And I'll give you two examples. Of course, we have to bring back the baboons of Kenya. I discovered that baboons in their first 14 months of life, the age that I studied, are quite active in finding out what foods to eat and how to process these foods. This may not sound like such a big deal, but in fact, baboons have complicated feeding patterns. Feeding for baboons is problem solving. The mothers are there eating certain foods, rejecting others, processing foods in a certain way, not in other ways. And the infant baboons themselves appear to be the ones to go around and learn how to do these things, make the right choices, and make the right processing moves. They are not taught. This is very interesting, and it's something we'll explore later when we talk about social learning and teaching. But they make use of the social bonds that they have in ways that result in their being able to know a lot about the diet of their group. But they do so quite actively, and their behavior changes what adults do. A second example involves great ape infants, but not in the wild, rather in captivity. Great ape infants engage in joint interaction with their mothers and their other family members as they try to coordinate their own needs and play out their own goals inside this family structure. 
For example, they may use their body posture, their body movements, vocalizations, and gestures together to change the behavior of adults in a way that is what we call contingent. In other words, they will move a certain way, adults will move back. But it's unpredictable how this is going to play out over the course of a sequence or an interaction. And it's unpredictable because each partner is responding to the other and they change and evolve as they go along in the interaction. That's what dynamic social interaction is all about. And I very much believe that that characterizes the period of infancy in monkeys and apes. And it's something that's a lot of fun to investigate. Now, as anthropoid infants grow away from their mothers and start broadening their social worlds in the way that I've described, they show increasingly curiosity, a desire to play, and in some cases, imagination. They've surprised us, the anthropologists, these infants have, in some of the sophistication they have shown in exhibiting these patterns. And again, I'm going to work by some example. Let's start with play. Play is ubiquitous in infancy for monkeys and apes. It happens um, unless there's some very unusual condition, let's say a food shortage or a drought or some stressor in the environment. Play is usually all happening all the time. And this is a very basic process that seems to aid the infants and juveniles in integrating into their social group. They may play with their peers, same aged animals, older animals, but it strengthens social bonds. They get to experience different animals in different ways and altogether seems to be a kind of cohesive type of social behavior. And as I said, it's very, very frequent. More rarely, however, anthropoid infants engage in behaviors that seem to be what we might call or might assume or might at least test to be more imaginative, more cognitive. Captive great ape infants, for example, play games with each other that we may not see in the wild. An example is what I can only call, um, following the primatologist, Franz Duval, blind man's bluff. That is, apes in a zoo, let's say, will be spinning around with hands over their own eyes, covering their eyes on purpose, and seem to be playing games of spinning with each other and trying not to see each other and seeing where they end up. In a way, we used to play blind man's bluff as children. To give another example, the anthropologist Richard Wrangham has seen something extremely interesting among the wild chimpanzees of Uganda. This is an anecdote that comes from his fieldwork, and it takes a little time to explain, but it's worth it. This is about an eight-year-old chimp named Kakama. And as Wrangham was watching this chimp, Wrangham noticed that the little male would carry with him a log, a fairly small log, but wherever the chimp went, he took the log with him. He would climb a tree, up would go the log. One time the log fell out of a tree and Kakama retrieved it. Well, it dawned on Rangam that there was something interesting going on here because of the positions that Kakama got into with the log. He carried it on all different parts all around his body and kept it with him. And then Rangam saw Kakama build a nest for his log, put the, nog, the log into the nest and climb in with it. Now what's so interesting about this is that chimpanzees almost every night build sleeping nests. They'll get a bunch of vegetation from the tree that they're in and bend it and move it around in such a way as to construct a small soft bed for themselves. Then they'll get into it and rest there. But they typically make beds only for themselves. In fact, Kakama is the only chimpanzee that anyone has ever seen ever make a nest for another chimp. He did this once at the age of five. He made a nest, a small one, and carried a one-year-old chimp and laid her down in it. And then, three years later, he made this nest for a log. Well, what does that tell us about Kakama's conception of what the log is? Now here we are going to get ourselves squarely into the anthropomorphism debate that we talked about last time, because we can only speculate but I'm going to defer to Rangham's speculation. He's a seasoned field researcher, and he suspects that this is some kind of a toy for
for Kakama, that there's some imaginative process going on. At least he offers this as a possibility. In fact, he even considers the possibility that this log may be something akin to a doll. In any case, it's a very interesting possibility and a very provocative example. Now, um, some anthropoid infants may stay quite emotionally close to their mothers throughout this period. I've been describing how they journey away from their mother, how they become more attracted to other peers and other relatives. But even so, I don't want to give you the impression that they're developing necessarily completely away from their mothers. We know that that just depends on what happens with the dispersal. In some cases, infants may end up, as they get older, physically totally apart from their mothers in different groups entirely. But what I'd like us to consider now is the possibility that even when anthropoids end up apart from their mothers, they still may be affected by their maternal upbringing. In other words, the idea under consideration here is that the type of upbringing an infant has stays with him or her throughout the life. Different mothers, we are beginning to understand, have different maternal styles in monkeys and apes, at least some monkeys and apes. For example, there's been work done among baboons. This was first carried out by Jean Altman, showing quite clearly that different baboons have different maternal styles. The two types of styles that she identified can be called restricted versus laissez-faire. Now, restricted maternal styles are those in which the mother keeps the infant quite close to her, literally re keeps the infant from exploring too much. The infant can't get away from her at a young age. She's very, very protective. Other mothers, the so-called laissez-faire mothers, are more relaxed. They may be quite content to have the infant wander off away from a young age, explore around her more, and are less restrictive. Now, I think we can consider that there may be costs and benefits to each style. If you're very free with your infant, it's possible that the infant may get itself into a dangerous situation. There may be a predator nearby, to give a dramatic example. If, on the other hand, you're a very restrictive type of mother who keeps your infant quite close in, well, what happens if you die early, the mother dies early, and the infant may not be prepared for independence as much as if it had been allowed to explore. But in any case, for our particular purposes, the interesting point is that this seems to be an intersection of maternal personality and maternal rank that helps determine how a mother acts. It is something that we've come to accept, most of us who study monkeys and apes, that there are different temperaments and different personalities in individuals of the same species. Altman found that there also was a relationship with rank that, at least in a very specific study she carried out, some of the high-ranking mothers tended to be more laissez-faire. So then you have an infant that is shaped in a very certain way from its youngest ages, and it goes on to grow up and presumably can be affected by this. We have data to show that this is in fact the case, this long period of being affected by maternal upbringing, and it comes from the work of Jane Goodall on chimpanzees. I have recommended for you in the booklet the reading of Through a Window by Jane Goodall. This is actually noted after lecture two, but it applies as well here. In Through a Window, one of Jane Goodall's themes is to suggest that as adults, chimpanzees are still showing the effects of how their mothers treated them. One very good example she brings is the chimpanzee Fifi. Now, Fifi is one of those offspring of Flo, whom we talked about, Flo who died in 1972, who was such a super mother. Fifi is one of, um, uh, also, just a tremendous mother, just like her mother. She has now had eight offspring, which is quite a lot. And her offspring have been what you might call the solid achievers of that chimpanzee community. They've risen in rank. They seem very stable and secure. She gives examples in this book of other mothers who have been much less secure and much less effective as mothers. 
and how the entire life course of their infants came out very, very differently than in flow and species family. So what does all this mean for roots of human behavior? I think we can see that there's a great deal of individual variation in motherhood and in infancy, but that mother-infant bond is central and solid. We can see, I believe, parallels with the human family. The idea of this dynamic interaction between infants and other relatives, and this idea that personality comes into effect in this joint dynamic interaction, and that one's personality can affect succeeding generations. So we've continued along our course in talking about anthropoid sociality, and I want to use um, one more lecture to go into depth about a subtype of anthropoid sociality, and that will take up the question of how adult males and adult females differ from each other. Lecture four, males and females, really so different. Hello again. Let's move along to a consideration of a different facet of anthropoid sociality. Let's consider adulthood, and specifically male-female differences in adulthood. We just reviewed at some length the developmental process in anthropoid infancy. We talked about some common patterns across anthropoid infants, for example, the extremely strong attachment and bond to the mother. We talked as well about how sex, whether one is male or female, is a particularly important variable in describing and understanding an infant's experience of life. Well, let's now apply that variable of sex to adult anthropoid primates and ask, are there dramatic sex differences between adult males and adult females when we consider monkeys and apes. Now to start off, I'd like to ask you to play along with a mental exercise and please envision for me a group of monkeys or apes, doesn't matter which, moving across the savanna in Africa. Imagine this scene. They're traveling together. They sight um, a tree that's just full of ripe fruit. As the group begins to approach the tree, we see the males large and powerful, that are slashing their canines and threatening the females. The males climb up into the tree and choose the best, most ripe and succulent fruit. The females are acting submissively and clutching their infants to their ventrums, backing away and getting the less wonderful fruit. As the group finishes eating and descends the tree, we see these males, or at least one male, approaching a female, again acting in a powerful manner and soliciting her for copulation. She backs up, they copulate, and then they separate. Okay, end of imagination. This is, I would submit, a very um, typical example of how males and females, monkeys and apes, tend to be portrayed in the popular literature and in television documentaries. There tend to be portrayals of dramatic male-female differences. Females tend to be depicted as mothers, as relatively passive creatures, except when it comes to nurturing, bonding with their infants, maybe nurturing and bonding with other relatives. They are seen as quite protective. They are seen as what we might call tied up in reproduction. By that I mean whole chunks of their lifespan are taken up with things that relate to reproduction. They conceive and carry infants. They give birth to them and then have to nurse them at great length through this process of weaning. So the popular portrayals tend to show monkeys and apes as one thing, as mothers. End of story. Similarly, males are shown to be very non-variant in their behavior. Males have a certain nature, and that nature is to be aggressive certainly to be aggressive with females. They may be aggressive with rival males as well. They're interested in power, and they're certainly capable of bossing around females. So in this case, males may use aggression to achieve reproductive ends. That is, they may use aggression to get copulations accomplished, and certainly they may end up 
as fathers. And obviously, the world needs fathers. You're not going to have infants. But they are not particularly uh, invested in nurturing. Rather, they're universally interested in rising in rank, bettering their position, using aggression as however they can to make their lot better in life. Now, to be fair, this popular picture is changing as we accumulate more scientific data, but it's changing fairly slowly. At least I hope it's changing. Let me ask you to complete another mental exercise with me. Please think of gorillas. Just think of a group of gorillas. And what comes to mind first? I can think of many options, but two that would be dramatically different one from the other. The one is a kind of King Kong image. You know that initial image that we all saw on TV, which is a large, violent male, perhaps roaring and beating its chest and racing around the group and stirring up trouble. The other image is quite different. It's a group of gorillas, the males, the females, the dependent offspring, basking in a restful, peaceful environment and eating bamboo and grass shoots. Which of the two is more accurate? Certainly the latter, the second one. And I think that the popular view is catching up with that. But even though the scientific data are beginning to infuse popular portrayals of anthropoid primates, the sex differences tends to be very, very resistant to change. I'm not entirely sure why that is. I do know that it has led to a series of questions that arise quite naturally if one is of the frame of mind that we're in in this course, Roots of Human Behavior. The questions that emerge are, all right, given humans' bioculture na biocultural nature, what does this mean if there are all these portrayals of dramatic sex differences between males and females? Are human sex differences inherited? Are women, perhaps, natural mothers? Are they made to be stay-at-home mothers and nurturers in the family? Are males made to be dominant over females and to strive for power in human society? This is um, a question that seems to relate to a very strong interest, at least in this country, in the United States, in sex differences, in gender differences. I guarantee you that if you read the newspapers, regularly, you listen to radio, watch the TV news, that you will very frequently hear headlines or emphasize stories about sex differences. I saw a headline just this week that proclaimed that, in fact, women, human females, are better at reading nuances and subtleties of facial expressions of people, a difference in their brains, the report said. I can give you so many other examples. One of my favorites is a study that was supposed to show that human males really do resist asking for directions when they're lost in driving. This may or may not be as meaningful to you as it is to me as a married woman with my husband, but this is one of those claims that there really is a sex difference. Women don't mind interacting with strangers and saying, hey, I'm lost, but men will resist doing so. It is still news in this country when it comes out that a woman's place is in the House, and the House turns out to be the Congress, and not the domestic residence. It is still news when a man chooses a career that is atypically um, true for men. For example, let's say a nurse, something like this. There is this subcurrent of interest in sex differences. Well, how do all these things fit together? We've only talked about a popular portrayal of monkeys and apes. Is that a correct portrayal? How can we straighten that out with scientific evidence? How can we talk about that? I want to begin doing so, but I first have to add an important sort of clarification. And that is in the 1960s and the 1970s, the start of the very scientific period of primatology in this country, it was also true that the scientific literature portrayed sex differences between male monkeys, female monkeys, or between female apes and male apes. In other words, in the 60s and 70s, there was a parallel between what we were finding scientifically and the type of uh, portrayal that I depicted for you at the start of this lecture. We, primatologists, studied females largely as mothers. We thought that the males were the leaders of groups around whom everybody else cohered. In fact, we 
gave credit to males as being the core, stable core of monkey and ape groups. Well, to sum up, we now know otherwise. We now, in the last 20, 25 years, have amassed a lot of data that complicate this picture in ways that I find quite interesting. First of all, we now know that female monkeys and apes also spend time and energy and effort striving for rank and sometimes for power and sometimes they aggress. In certain species, females may outrank males. Not a lot, but it happens. In what the primatologist Pat Wright estimates to be 40% of all primates, males and females share dominance within a group. In other words, there are multiple patterns of dominance. It is not the case that males always dominate through aggression. Furthermore, it is not the case that females must choose between being mothers and being interested in this other side of life. Motherhood does not preclude an interest in rank and power. Now, similarly, just as it's wrong to paint all anthropoid females as mothers, it's just as inaccurate to claim that all anthropoid males are of the same nature. It may be the case that some anthropoid males are not very aggressive. There's a difference in what we've talked about so much already, personality and temperament. It may be the case that some males aggress in a certain situation, but not in another. So you have both individual variation in what they're primed to do and when they express it. Males um, should not be considered as non-variant anymore than females. I can, just by thinking back to my period of field work with baboons, can come up with a good example for you of how power can be consolidated in a group of related females. Now we've talked, if you can remember back, to thinking about monkeys, baboons, macaques, and vervets, for example, the really well-studied monkeys that there are groups of related females because the males disperse at puberty. These groups of related females are called matrilines, the aunts, the sisters, the grandmothers, the mothers, and so forth. And it is possible to have top-ranking and less high-ranking matrilines in a group. And again, this is really the core of the group, the stable part of the group. I remember very clearly, I can see her, there was a female baboon in Kenya who was of the high-ranking matriline. She had female relatives all around her, and she not only was high-ranking, but she would like to demonstrate her high rank to other females. Another low-ranking female had recently had an infant, and as you won't be surprised to hear, lots of other animals were coming up and ex inspecting, exploring the infant. And this one high-ranking female came up and put her arm around the new mother. It was a supposedly friendly gesture, but underneath it, one could see the way she did this, her body posture, her gaze, her orientation. This was a demonstration of power. This is what I can do. I can invade your space. I can come up to you. I can eat right around you. I can touch your infant. And this type of expression of power was quite routine within matrilines. So you end up with all different patterns, both of dominance within a group and expression of dominance and aggression across individuals. Given this variation then, it is impossible to say, well, we humans have evolved a male nature or a female nature. And I want to go further and really explore this. And I want to get more concrete for you. Except for the baboon example, I've been fairly theoretical so far in this lecture. And I want to play out this discussion of male-female sex differences by looking at our closest living relatives the four great apes that by now you have become familiar with. I have told you and you no doubt have been practicing with your species sketches so that you could tell me the four great apes are the orangutan, the gorilla, the chimpanzee, and the bonobo. What I haven't emphasized so much so far is that until quite recently we did not know one of these great apes very well, the bonobo. The bonobo was discovered only in the 20th century, and it only became known to primatologists in any depth at all, starting in the late 70s and the 1980s. 
So this led to a curious type of circumstance that I want to describe for you. Yes, we had hundreds and thousands of hours of data on the orang, gorilla, and chimpanzee. But ironically enough, those data ended up reinforcing the popular portrayal of sex differences between males and females. In other words, the data suggested a common pattern that yes, males do tend to be aggressive and boss around females. Not so much that females were only mothers, but more that there's this big difference in dominance and aggression. And I'd like to take you through those data and then bring in at the end of that discussion the bonobo and show you why the bonobo was so important for an exploration of males and females. Okay, let's start with orangutans and gorillas. We'll consider them together for a minute because they have some major features in common. One thing they have in common is that the males are quite a bit bigger than the females. They are, in some cases, as much as twice as big, twice as heavy. Males have what we call secondary sex characteristics. That is, big canine teeth, big um, ridges of muscle on their heads, or big cheek pads, depending on the species. Some extra sort of anatomical characteristic that relates to their big size. This difference in size and anatomy between males and females is called sexual dimorphism. Now dimorphism means two structures. Di is two, morph is structure. Dimorphism is two structures and sexual is the qualifier, two structures by sex. So we have this similarity with the orangs and gorillas. And what this means then is that there is an anatomical pathway, if you will, for males to be able to boss around females. They simply outweigh them and outpower them in many ways. Another commonality between orangs and gorillas is the lack of female-female bonds. Now, in orangutans, we know that there really is no coherent, cohesive social group. There may be social bonds, but they do not exist between females, and that is very important. So the females are essentially on their own in dealing with these large power for males. The gorilla females do have a group. There may be six or eight females together, maybe more in a group, but they still do not bond with each other. They are relatively indifferent to each other. They have transferred in around the magnet of the male or two male and don't um, come in together. They're not kin, they're not close associates. So these two factors together are quite important. Sexual dimorphism, lack of male, I'm sorry, lack of female-female bonds. So how does this express itself? Let's start with gorillas. In gorillas, you know that if there's only one or two males per group, but multiple females, this must mean that there are other males out there excluded from having groups. So you have resident males in groups and excluded males. These excluded males attempt to take over groups and take them for their own. There is male-male competition in gorillas. There is male-male threatening and male-male fighting. This can be at times quite aggressive and quite violent. In addition, let's say a takeover is successful and the head of a group is wounded or banished and leaves, the new male comes in. Not always, but quite frequently, this new male will then commit infanticide. Infanticide is killing of infants. The new male will kill the youngest weaned, pre-weaned infants. In other words, the infants that are still drinking mother's milk. This is, of course, violent behavior. Why would they do this? This makes evolutionary sense. Constant suckling is a form of birth control. When great ape mothers allow their infants to suckle around the clock, this prevents them hormonally from being able to be impregnated. They're not fertile during this time. Therefore, if a new mover and wants to impregnate a female and have offspring of his own, a quick and efficient way to do this is to simply kill the infant. Evolutionarily, it makes sense. This is not any kind of a moral judgment on our part, just this idea that we can understand this. And this happens um, relatively frequently. So here we have patterns of aggression and dominance by males. In orangutans, even outside the social group context, 
we find that males may, subadult males, sometimes adult males, forcibly copulate with females. That is, hold females down against what appears to be their will and copulate with them. Anthropomorphically, some people call this rape. Others prefer to call it forced copulation. In any case, it is violent behavior. So all of these data together, again, come up with different ways to express male dominance and aggression, but the expression nonetheless. Let's move to chimpanzees. Here we have a different situation. Chimpanzees are not particularly sexually dimorphic. The males are a little bit bigger and heavier than the females, but not appreciably so, and nothing like the degree to which we see in orangs and gorillas. However, male chimpanzees in any given community tend to be kin. That is, they tend to be relatives. And you should be able to figure out why if you think back to dispersal. Females disperse in chimpanzees. Males stay. They form the opposite of matrilines. We might call them patrilines, groups of related males. And the males collectively work together. They go around and behave together. They may, for example, patrol the borders of the community. And if they come across strangers during this patrolling behavior, they may react violently. But let's look within the community. It is the case that even the lowest ranking male chimpanzee still is dominant over the highest ranking female chimpanzee. This is definitely male dominance without any question here. So again, you can see why it was possible for scholars to say, look at all these great apes. Look at our closest living relatives. Whether we like it or not isn't the question. It is a fact that males dominate females and that males are aggressive. At certain time periods, then, this was made into um, theory that would impact upon human sex differences and human evolution. There are lots of books that were put out in the 60s and the early 70s that talked about these types of things. One that is kind of related to what we're talking about was written by Robert Ardrey. He talked about this idea of aggression as an instinct in humans, particularly for males, but something that is ingrained in us, is something that we have inherited. All right, I mentioned that the fourth great ape, the bonobo, would shift the picture for us. Well, how does it do that? Well, it does it quite dramatically, actually. Since, oh, I'd say about 1980, when we began to get good field data on bonobos, we noticed a very different pattern. Um, actually, bonobos are only found in one African country, and they're found in places that are quite hard to reach and hard to study. It's a challenging ape to study. That country is the Democratic Republic of Congo, which until quite recently was called Zaire. You may know it better under the name of Zaire. In any case, when the data started coming back, what did we see? OK, two commonalities with chimpanzees. Not very much sexual dimorphism, just like chimps. And I'm sorry, one commonality with chimpanzees, really. Not very much sexual dimorphism, but other dramatic differences. There seemed to be peaceable relationship between males and females. There wasn't a lot of dominance behavior expressed. There wasn't a lot of aggression expressed. If you went in and studied a community, you would see, in some cases, males and females sharing dominance, and in some particular cases, females being dominant. And there was one other striking difference as well compared to chimpanzees, strong female-female bonds. Now, this really was a surprise. Bonobos have female transfer at puberty, just like chimpanzees. So they have females in the communities that are not related. And this led everyone to predict that there would be an absence of female-female bonds. But in fact, that's not the case. There are females who ally with each other to uh, work against a male. There's what we might call female-female resistance to male attempts when they occur at dominance or aggression. They occur very often, but the female bonds seem to be central. And of course, I fear you're going to ask me why. Why do females and bonobos bond and females and chimpanzees don't? Well, we really don't have a very good answer to that. I could give you some speculation. 
One speculation relates to the nature of sexual behavior in bonobos. Female-female sexual behavior is quite frequent in the species, unlike in chimpanzees. And this provides a particular route or pathway or avenue for females to bond with each other. But you could then say, well, why is the sexual behavior different? And we could keep going with, you know, constant questions. So again, we have hypotheses, but we want to focus on the outcome. And the outcome is that we have bonobos that really make it impossible to use great apes as a way to say that male dominance, male aggression is natural. I want to go over three very precise reasons then why the bonobo was so important. The bonobo I think of as the feminist's favorite anthropoid primate. At William and Mary, as you know, I teach in anthropology, but I also teach courses in the women's studies program. And whenever I get to bonobos, the feminist scholars and the students get very excited because this overturned theories of universality of male dominance in anthropoids. So let's talk about why they're so important. First of all, it is really important to remember that bonobos and chimpanzees are both equally closely related to humans. Both of them are our closest living relatives of all, even closer than the gorilla and the orangutan. So we can't just dismiss the bonobo and say, oh, they're distantly related to us, so what's the difference anyway? They're really closely related to us. Second, it's a crystal clear example of shared dominance, occasional female dominance. It's not in any way marginal or questionable. It's across different sites. It's just very solid. And thirdly, the bonobo example is not exceptional. It is exceptional among great apes. But when we go back to think about the broad canvas that we're talking about, the anthropoid primates, it is not exceptional. Remember the statistic I gave you for all primates, 40% share dominance, according to Pat Wright. Well, it is also the case that the bonobo has led us to look more closely then at other situations in which there may be shared dominance or female dominance. Another example that I could give you comes from a South American monkey called the muriqui, studied in Brazil by the primatologist Karen Stryer. She has found that these monkeys are not very sexually dimorphic, that the males and females share dominance, that the males and females have a relatively peaceable existence. So we're again looking at other examples thanks to what we have learned from the bonobo, or at least partly thanks to that. So we don't ever want to discount this phenomenon that we might call female resistance to this theory of male dominance or male aggression. Now, I don't want to push all this too far and seem to be arguing for a situation that is endlessly mutable. It's not. You will not walk into a chimpanzee community and find a situation in which the females are bossing around the males. Feminist utopia, maybe, but it doesn't happen. At least it hasn't happened yet. We've never found it yet. I predict we won't. Chimpanzees are about male dominance. But I do think that going beyond just the focus on orangs, gorillas, and chimps is very, very important for this topic. And so, in the concluding minutes, I'd like to tell you in a kind of summary way what I usually try to, to do at the end of a lecture. The familiar question is, so what does all this tell us about roots of human behavior? Well, the two major conclusions that we've reached are that it's very variable whether you have male dominance or co-dominance across anthropoid species. Secondly, that in all cases, some males will be aggressive and some won't. Some females may be relatively aggressive or interested in power and ranking. We know in chimpanzees, some females join border patrols. We know in chimpanzees, some females don't strive for high dominance rank or for aggression. So as a result, there is, we can conclude, no instinct to be a certain way as a female anthropoid. There's no instinct to be a certain type of thing as an anthropoid male. And I think that this is an important lesson for us, for humans, that there isn't a legacy that we're inheriting of a male nature or a female nature. 
there's a complex web of factors that interact to produce individual personality and temperament and nature. We have learned that females are more than mothers, males are more than power strivers and aggressors, and that it is possible and often seen for the sexes to cooperate and share dominance. Now, from here, I'd like to go into a discussion of sexual behavior and reproduction that picks up on this male-female theme and I think may come up with some surprising results.